Hello, I'm Mark Hughes. Welcome to this edition of Disability Viewpoints. We were going to have a whole show on voting today, but due to the untimely death of Margo M. Dyke Cross, who uh, was the state of Minnesota and uh, led the disability community in a lot of ways, we're going to discuss a lot of that today. Yes, we've got several individuals here today. We're going to celebrate Margo's wonderful life as a state's accessibility specialist. She was a force to be reckoned with, so I can't wait to hear, friends and colleagues, what kind of stories you might have um, so we can all continue to remember all the great things that Margo <coughs> did. Well, I knew Margo before accessibility was even known. Um, a lot of us, because of our disabilities, ended up in care centers when we were at the age of moving out of the parents because there's no accessible housing. And then the Vietnam vet came home from the, the war and they also ran into the same mess we did. But they also were being harassed because of the war. Describe the mess. The mess is no affordable, accessible housing, no curb cuts, no accessible driving, uh, no accessible public transportation. I mean, there was nothing. So if you put yourself out there in the street someplace, mm -hmm. and you want to go somewhere, you were basically out on the streets if you had a mobility device. And that was dangerous. And this is still happening in small towns. Right. Yeah. And, yeah. and the public restrooms? There, were, there was no rest, public restrooms. There, there was no real elevators. Only a few buildings had elevators. Um, no real accessible uh, bathrooms, right. restrooms. Uh, restaurants had steps. I mean, everywhere you went, there was a step. And if you couldn't get up a step, you couldn't go anywhere. And that included the seat, uh, streets. Uh, if you didn't have a curb cut, we went into the driveways. We were wheeling the streets. In the alleys? In the alleys. Right. We went someplace where nobody should really be dry, wheeling their street, they're wheeling their wheelchair or mobility device because of the danger. But that was the way we got around. Things were just not, not easy for anybody. No public transportation. Sure. Yeah, you had to depend on people to get you around, and if you couldn't get into a vehicle, you were basically stuck. Uh, no affordable public housing for anybody uh, that needed to be living on their own. The independence was not there. Right. Margo basically said, that's it. We have got to get our equal rights. This was before society even knew what equal rights were. Right. They didn't even know what accommodations were or anything like that. Or if they did, they totally ignored it. So Margo basically, she knew where to call. She knew exactly where all of us were. And so she gave us the call to say, it's time. It's time for us to speak out. And she coordinated a lot of the rallies, the protests, all that stuff. And one thing that always stuck in my mind was she always would say, you fight for your rights. Don't be afraid of what you're doing if you're doing it for the right way and you're doing it for everybody. And don't back down. Don't yeah. let somebody talk don't to you. Don't back down. Yeah. Well, let's move on to another person, um, Cindy Tarsus with the Metropolitan Center for Independent Living in ADA, Minnesota. I'm fortunate I uh, was a close colleague. She was my mentor. She was my good friend, um, all of those things. So um, it was an honor and a pleasure to plan those ADA celebrations. And, you know, I'm also lucky because in my job at ADA Minnesota, I have to be knowledgeable of five titles of the ADA. Nobody can know everything. So I always was comforted in the fact that I could always check with Margo um, before I made a final decision or offered advice to somebody. Um, she might never made me feel bad um, if I needed help on anything accessibility related. She always wanted it to be right and perfect. And um, and it always was when I, when I checked in with her. Um, Margo's, I think one of her final words to me, we were talking about, we, we were, I was lucky um, myself and, and Ann Roscoe and Duluth, we have this Zoom a happy hour uh, for the past four years of the pandemic. We check in every Thursday from 5 to 5.40. And um, one of our last um, 
Zoom happy hours with us and our husbands was uh, talking about our celebration of life. You know, she decided who was going to do what, where, and how, and, you know, we, we were all in line. And she was grilling me on the fact that she knew my husband and I would be helping with parking about the diagonal parking law. She said, you understand the diagonal parking law, that if there's not enough disability parking spots, that you could take up two spots and park diagonal. And she was quizzing me on it. I said, Margo, I appreciate this so much. I understand that law. You know, we're good to go. And again, she's like, but you, you have to enforce it. You have to make sure everybody has accessible parking at my celebration of life, you know, and, and have everybody park diagonal and do what you need to do with the orange cones. And she Sure, sure, sure. And don't you know, as we say in Minnesota, don't you know that uh, when when my husband was out doing the parking with so many uh, other wonderful volunteers at the Celebration of Life, uh, the woman from the venue came out and said, oh, no, 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 you can't do that. You can't take up two spots and whatever, whatever. And my husband starts to quote <laughs> this law that Margo said on the Zoom call, and he was adamant, and he stood his ground, and he was—he said, you know, Margo is speaking through me, this is the law, and we're taking up these spots. So to the very end, she was educating me and uh, training all of us. It's fabulous. Well, you'll notice on our table, we've got um, some mini disability parking signs, and that was one of Margo's expertise. Um, why don't we keep moving on? Sure. Jeff Bangsberg, longtime um, advocate worked in a variety of um, areas um, for the display community and a um, good friend of Margo's. If it wasn't for Margo, I don't think I ever would have become an advocate in the disability community. Um, I would like to um, wind all the way back into the late 70s or early 1980s when the Consumer Advisory Council for Vocational Rehabilitation was organized and she recruited me to be on that committee. She recruited me to help develop the bylaws for that committee. And this was before the um, actual organization of the now called State Rehabilitation Council for the representation of people with disabilities to sit on those committees and to, to really talk about how we're going to employ or find more employment opportunities for people with disabilities. And with that uh, opportunity to get to know her throughout the years, she had a wonderful way of recruiting individuals who were going to be most directly affected by the laws that she was trying to encourage people to take into account or the modifications of buildings that people were going to need to make for people to enjoy and just like anybody else, a ball game or a football game or um, uh, any of the sports venues in the Twin Cities. Uh, I remember when the uh, the Twin Stadium was going to be uh, developed and she said to me, Jeff, who can you think of who goes to ball games? I want to know who they are, um, especially people with disabilities, because we need them to be involved in the Access Advisory Committee. And she really wanted those individuals who appreciated the sport to be at the table to determine what needs to be done to make it a pleasant experience. Everything from getting to the to the restrooms, to the to the vending um, tables, making sure all of the tables were at the right height, to the places where everybody was sitting. So in case anybody stood up, you can still see over them and if they're um, cheering for a home run. And she had that uncanny ability to make sure that all those individuals who had a desire to see that sport had the opportunity to have a say in how these venues were going to be drawn up at, on the architectural table in order for them to be in place for when the ballpark was going to be open. Thanks for being on, Jeff. We could be talking two hours. Um, yeah. um, Erica Rivers, who's the executive director of Wilderness Inquiry, as well as she'd been working with the Department of um, DNR, Natural Resources for years, working with Margo. And of course, pa Paul uh, Shartsky, I may have mispronounced your name here, Paul, um, went into the, um, I think you know, Margo and you were some of the first people to go into the Boundary Waters and explore that. Can you guys talk a couple of minutes to, briefly about all the good work Margo um, and you folks did together? Yeah, absolutely. I can get a start and then Paul uh, Paul can join in. Um, I was 
blessed to have Margo as a colleague, a mentor, and a friend. Um, and ultimately, she was the inspiration uh, it took for me to to change my career path and come uh, leave the uh, Department of Natural Resources as Director of State Parks and come to Wilderness Inquiry full time about three years ago. And I have um, such wonderful memories of Margo as a mentor and a friend, some of the things that have already been said today. Um, one of the things that I will take with me throughout the rest of my career is uh, Margo's famous phrase, nothing about us without us. And um, I remember uh, in the spirit of that, um, riding around at, at Fort Snelling State Park with, with Margo in the first um, all-terrain wheelchair that we were testing out for state parks, which is actually a precursor, precursor to the, the uh, all-terrain um, track chairs that are there today. Um, but Margo and I went all around um, the Fort Snelling State Park. Uh, I was driving the track chair and she was holding on and wheeling with with uh, me. And, and we they talked at her, her um, memorial about how uh, her famous wheelie popping in her wheelchair and she was doing that. Uh, this was maybe eight years ago, you know, so she right to the end was uh, quite the sport. Um, but Margo, all along the way throughout that whole uh, ride around Fort Snelling State Park was was giving me advice and um, things to think about as we were trying to think about how to how to uh, manage these uh, new chairs in state parks. And um, this this was like the beginning of what I what I would then call my Margo moments, um, which were just and I think everybody on this call can relate to it. Margo had this um, way of just sprinkling in little lessons in anywhere you went with her um, when she was on the Parks and Trails Legacy Advisory Committee, for example, um, I was checking into a hotel with her. And um, she said, hey, look at this reception desk. And you see how I can't even see the person on the other side. And they could fix this by just having uh, a slight cutout over here that would have uh, some place for me to write. Or uh, when we were pulling open a door to a bathroom, Erica, the pressure on this bathroom door isn't quite right. You know, it needs to be at five pounds or less. Um, we were sitting, you know, talking about accessible uh, campgrounds and she wheeled up to the to the um, fire rings there at the campsite and, and was was giving us some advice on um, how to make those uh, those fire rings a little more accessible and easy to move for somebody that was uh, using a wheelchair. So, it, you know, just did it in this in, in incredibly, um, you know, very direct uh, way that Margo had, but also in a way that just gave lots of grace and lots of ideas of how to make things better. And I just always admired the way she was able to um, really uh, change the change of the direction um, we were going in those really simple ways. Well, I met Margaret nearly 50 years ago now, and she was very instrumental in the founding of Wilderness Inquiry, flagship program offering wilderness adventures now all over the world. Thank you, Erica, for the great job your staff is doing there still. Because um, Greg Lace and I kind of tag teamed it way back when to get it going. Uh, and Greg spoke beautifully at the memorial service last week on Margo. But our remember, when Margo was with us on the very first trip, this was back in August of 77, we were engaged in a political battle then. And while Margo was all about accessibility, this was sort of the antithesis of accessibility to go into a wilderness area where Margo was very concerned that we not make wilderness accessible, that people be allowed to continue enjoying wilderness on its own terms. And there was a huge argument afoot in Minnesota at the time that the wilderness needed motorboats and ski planes and snowmobiles if people who were elderly or disabled wanted to enjoy it. And Margo said, no way, wilderness should be left as it is, and we should all be able to enjoy it on its own terms. So she gave us a quick lesson on how that works on that first trip. Greg and I didn't quite know what we were getting into. And we, for those of you who've been to the Bondi Wars, you know it's a pretty rough and tumble <laughs> place. And coming to the first portage, pulled the canoes up on the gravel landing and got the gear out of the canoe. And I was all prepared to sling Margo over my shoulders and shoulder her across the portage. And she said, no way. You're not, I'm, not, I'm going to be no sack of potatoes. I'll get over this portage come hell or high water. And she did. She w worked her way across, dragging her wheelchair behind us. And that was the last time I thought about carrying her over a portage. And she sort of set the stage for what would follow. And then later in the trip, it went down okay, but we got into a pickle and a huge storm on big, beautiful Lac LaCroix Lake. We get caught exposed on a raw island out in the middle of the waters. And the storm raged through the nights and blew our tents to shreds and left everyone soaked to the bone by the morning. And our only option was this bedraggled crew was to paddle our way fiercely 15 miles up the lake to a small resort on the Canadian side and seek refuge and rescue to get out of our wet, soaking wet clothes and our limited supply of food. 
And they took us in nicely at the resort there and put all our stuff in a big dryer and got it sorted out. Um, and the next day broke clean and clear, blue sky, bluebird day. And the resort said, why don't you just take one of our little fishing boats, little mortar boat, and you can pedal you, you more your way back on, uh, to get on your on your route. And, and uh, offered the prospect of a mortar boat, <laughs> Margo <clears throat> it said, no way, we're not taking no mortar boat. We're here to paddle and we're going to paddle on out of here and paddle we did. And then Margo joined our uh, charter board of directors and was a key instrumental player in everything that's happened with the Wilderness Inquiry in the years since. So thank you, Margo, for that. And thank you for Margo for helping to launch my career because it really set the stage for my approach to wilderness and all the adventures I've done since uh, with Ann Bancroft and Will Seeger to the North Pole and beyond and so forth. And Margo has been part of that art right along. Thank you for being on. Say hi to Ann Bancroft for me, if you would, please. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Senator John Marty is with us, um, longtime um, colleague of um, with, he's utilizing Margo at the Capitol for a variety of legislative issues. And he was also gracious enough to do the eulogy um, at Margo's celebration of lights last week, which is fantastic. So what kinds of thoughts and memories do you have of um, Senator Marty of Margo? Sure, and at the memorial service, using stories from so many others like Paul and Jeff and Erica and others, we uh, her, her the way she touched so many lives is just incredible. Um, as one who works in the public policy arena, I knew Margo before I got elected, which is many decades ago now. Um, and I knew I didn't talk to her nearly as often as any of you would have, but whenever she called, it was always full of some new idea or new we got to solve this problem or something where we need to change the laws or the rules or set up zoning things differently. And I think when you talk to anybody who worked in building codes and um, development of projects, big projects in the last many years, Margo was a force that they knew. They all knew her and they knew she was tough and they knew you don't want to go against Margo because she will let you have it. But they also knew she was very forgiving and, hey, you make a mistake, you're going to fix it but we're not gonna complain about the mistakes. We're gonna fix things and make things better in the end. And I think every step along the way, she shared that way, she showed up that way. She had so many, um, I think Stu, her husband, when I asked her how he would, him how he would describe her, and he said, Margo had a big heart. He said, she was tough, but she had a big heart. And, and I don't know anybody who was as tough as she was who had such a big heart and so kind and caring about everyone. And one of the stories I was able to tell because it had been shared with me by others who had known her, one said she knew Margo as an eight-year-old at G Gillette Children's Hospital. And even then she was causing trouble, good trouble as John Lewis would call it. But she was always, even then causing trouble, said one story about how after lights out at the hospital, she would sneak into other rooms of kids and tie wheelchairs together. And then she helped drag them all down to the kitchen, raid the fridge for some snacks. Um, lots of kids would raid the fridge when they're after lights out with, if they could get away with it. Margo didn't do it for herself. She brought all these kids in and she brought everybody along. And that's true of all the policies she fought for. They said at the ADA signing um, that People and the dignitaries, the elected officials, everybody were up front, and the folks using wheelchairs were in the back. And when the president walked in, everybody up front stood up, and others in the back were yelling, sit down in front. And I picture that's perfectly what Margo was about. She, she wasn't a rude person. She wasn't nasty. But when somebody was doing something that blocked somebody else's access, when they blocked somebody else's rights, their justice, um, she would be very vocal in that case. And it wasn't just for people with um, mobility impairments. She fought for people with mental health needs. She fought for any kind of justice for people who are suffering because of poverty or age discrimination or race or gender or anything. Um, she fought for justice for all. And her legacy is very much visible and not just in her individual work with this city council and so on, but throughout our state laws and even the National ADA and everything. I think Margo was a national and, and state recognized leader in accessibility and making sure it actually happened. Welcome back to Disability Viewpoints. I'm Mark Hughes. We're now joined 
Joan Wilshire uh, back on the show. Well, we're going to continue on, and uh, we've got Craig Dunn here in the studio with us today. And Craig is the former executive director of ESA and has worked with Margo on numerous issues, the ADA celebration in particular. Um, what are your, some of your thoughts regarding Margo? Well, some of the things that I remember most about Margo was that, yes, Margo was you know, passionate in her work, but she was passionate in her life too. And she loved, uh, you know, VSA was all about the arts and, and Margo loved the arts. And she knew that we had a grant program uh, that we distributed money to uh, metro area arts organizations so that they could be more accessible. And one of the things I remember the most was there was an organization and, and uh, the organization was Cedar Cultural Center and they came to us for a grant. And uh, as I recall, it was some work in the lobby and so they, they received the grant, they did their work in the lobby, and I said, Margo, you go to Cedar Cultural Center. Good thing, right? Well, I still have to go into the men's bathroom because that is the only accessible bathroom that Cedar Cultural Center has. Well, the next round came around and Cedar Cultural Center submitted an application, and this time it was for an outside gathering area with with community space and lots of things and I said oh well that's unfortunate but that's what they're wanting and they received that grant and I said Margo great right no no the bathroom is still inaccessible to me and finally mm -hmm. we said we at VSA Minnesota said you cannot come to VSA Minnesota for another grant request unless it's the bathroom. <laughs> and sure enough, they did submit the application for that and they were successful again that year in getting that grant. And I will always remember the opening uh, of that bathroom to the public. Uh, it's a unisex uh, accessible bathroom right in the middle. Uh, and she and Stephanie Cunningham, I believe, and Martha Haig, uh, sitting at the door in, in front of it, just thumbs up and smiling. So uh, she was then, she and Stuart uh, were then able to go to the Cedar Cultural Center with their friends and she was able to use a bathroom for her. Great, Great. fabulous. Great yes, story. that's Margo, totally. Great story. Right, 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 right. Thanks for being here. Yeah. Joe Herbs, you've been, um, integral part of many disability community events yeah, and especially the this show i want to say before she right. gets going thanks mark um you know i have worked with margo for, through many different things um and when i shared information with the centers for independent living on Margot's passing, I received several that I'd like to share at least one of them with you. Um, one of them is from Randy Sorensen, who's with Options Center for Independent Living out of the Fargo area. And um, he said, Margot had been a resource for me from the start of my work in Minnesota in 1988. Into her, um, into her retirement back in the dim ages when an accessible bathroom stall was pretty much a stall you could get your chair into where you could face the toilet and have to transfer 180 degrees similar to a trick on a pommel horse. It was the vertical grab bar that made the difference for so many that she could that they could use the restroom. I was told Margo advocated and got past the vertical grab bar into Minnesota code all those many years ago. Minnesota had that bar reviewed and okayed as a more stringent requirement to the ADA for the state, which was later added to the International Building Code um, for Minnesota. And we've always referred to it as Margo's bar. Later, Options was having problems with a city not enforcing the Minnesota Accessibility Code 
through Minnesota statute required that there were no teeth. After talking to Margo, she added to the Minnesota Council on Disabilities legislative agenda and changed the law adding teeth. Um, there are advocates that advocate to the letter of the law, and there are those that change the spelling. And Margo was definitely one of those, as we've all heard, and Randy says, I already miss her, as did Kara Ruff from the Independent Living Center in Sauk Rapids. May she rest in peace, knowing what an incredible impact she has made. And like all of you, there were a couple more comments from the Independent Living Council directors that worked with Margo on a lot of issues, whether it was employment, accessibility, um, any of the five areas of the ADA. From the disability viewpoint standpoint, and Joan, you can relate to this because you were a part of this, is that Margo and Joan and Stephanie um, Cunningham, is that who that was, did um, the um, movie ladies. And they would come on disability viewpoints and um, critique movies. And Margo's biggest complaint for the film industry was that they did not use individuals with disabilities to play certain parts of individuals with disabilities. And that frustrated Margot to no end. And that was always her biggest complaint about movies is if you're gonna do something about an individual with disabilities, then use an individual with disabilities who's in the film industry. Um, and then as many of these other people have talked about, I worked with Margot on many planning committees especially for the ADA. The other thing I worked with Margo on that she always impressed me with was her knowledge about emergency preparations. And there were several of us that worked to create a manual on how people should participate and include people with disabilities in their emergency preparedness. Um, planning and her knowledge about that was amazing. Um, and I understand that the Minnesota Council on Disabilities is now going to upgrade that manual. And so Margot's legacy with that will continue to live on as they revise that manual. So she had um, great impact on me in many different areas of my life. And I will miss her. I as as I've been thinking about this, it's like where um, she was in everything that I worked on, and I really, really appreciated all of her her impact and all of her training. And um, she taught me a lot on working with people with disabilities. So I thank Margot for that. Well, I want to take this time to thank uh, everybody who was involved today. Joan Wilshire gave it a gallant effort. Joe Urbis is uh, the backbone of the show. Steve Brunsberg made us look great again production-wise. I want to thank Senator John Marty for being here. And Margo, of course, led the disabled community uh, in the office. But when it comes to the Senate and the House, we really wouldn't be any place without Senator John Marty, so thanks a million. I hope you can hear me. And and Cindy Tarsh is again, thanks for what you did for putting everything together the last couple of weeks. And Wilderness Inquirer, I'll, I always hold a soft spot in my heart because of Ann Bancroft and all the good work the people do over there. And to you at home, thanks for being here very, during this very difficult time. And we'll, we promise we'll have a voting show next time we come on the air. So thanks for watching this. Billy Viewpoints, we appreciate your support. It wasn't our normal format today, but we hope you understand. We'll see you soon. Bye for now.